Welcome. I'm the director of the Global Labor Research Center at York University or the GLRC. My name is Luann Good Gingrich. And we're really pleased to welcome you here today for this webinar. This is the third and final webinar in our series. The series is called Contested Reproduction of States and Societies in Financialized Capitalism, Comparative Views from Turkey. I'll say just a little bit about the background of this series. In June of this year, the GLRC and the Department of Politics at York University hosted a workshop. Um, and the workshop was entitled Contested Reproduction of Turkey's Financialized Capitalism, State and Society in Crisis. The workshop brought together critical scholars of political economy working on the case of Turkey and the recent authoritarian drive in that country. The papers problematized the con constitutive role of financialization and authoritarian state transformation, state policies that weaken the power of labor in relation to capital, and the enhancement of the course of capacity of state and capital for social control. Besides identifying the Turkey specific determinants and consequences of authoritarianism, the June workshop situated the Tur Turkish experience within its global context. And in this fall workshop series, we've picked up on that discussion and adopt a comparative focus to interrogate how transformative political pressures faced faced by the Turkish state and other countries are both the product of and the driving force behind current configurations of global capitalism. To this end, we're hosting Turkish scholars working on the Turkish case or other countries with a view from Turkey to compare and contrast selected country case examples. Our focus is on the social, political and economic conditions leading to authoritarian state transformations and the implications for work and labor, for local and global economies, and for the social fabric of societies. Our discussion for today is entitled Politics of Corruption and State Transformation, Turkey and China Compared. And I also want to thank the York Center for Asian Research for co-sponsoring today's webinar. I'll turn it over now to Dr. Epek Aaron Viral, uh, currently an adjunct pr professor in the Department of Political Science at Dalhousie University, who will introduce and chair our discussion. So, Epek. Okay, <laughs> now I'm unmuted myself. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Today, uh, I found that we, I, we have a very uh, good uh, papers that focus on uh, one of the important strategies that we see in almost all capitalist states and capitalist restructuring processes, uh, which is corruption, uh, or it's in its more uh, popular uh, term, cronism. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm currently, uh, Associate. I'm currently leading research in Canada, and uh, I'm working on how financialization affects uh, drug regulation uh, in Canada. <laughs> but of course, uh, uh, I am still. I still have my ties uh, to uh, politics in Turkey. Um, so this, the uh, the presentations uh, are very uh, dear to my heart. But in addition to that they are also, also reminiscent uh, of the processes that we also see in Canadian politics. So the audience here will have uh, recollections of uh, today's topics in SNC leveling cases or the we cases that we have seen uh, over the last years or so. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Pnar Bederhanoğlu, which I'm sure you are all uh, aware, uh, has long been working on uh, politics uh, of corruption. Uh, and likewise, uh, Dr. Uh, Ceren Ergenç is also uh, a, an important uh, expert in the area in, on Chinese uh, politics. So today uh, I'm just going to, uh, each of our uh, speakers will uh, speak for 10 minutes uh, and then they will reflect on each other's uh, presentations. 
and then we will be uh, we will open the floor uh, for questions and answers. Uh, so, Pnar, over to you. Okay. Thanks, Ipek. Uh, thanks a lot for, for the introduction and thanks, Luan, for your introduction as well. Let me uh, first thank, uh, indeed, uh, GLRC and Luan for giving us this opportunity to discuss uh, Turkish neoliberal state transformation on a comparative basis uh, in these follow-up uh, webinars. It has been a pleasure for me to collaborate with York University in this project. Uh, I believe that we have done very good discussion so far uh, by rethinking comparative cases uh, always within a global context. And I hope our final webinar today will contribute to this end of year, this time uh, with a focus on uh, Turkey and China. Let me move uh, then directly to my analysis uh, on Turkey. Um, privatized relations between state and capital uh, that move beyond the defined public limits have always been a topic in Turkish politics uh, since indeed the establishment of the modern republic. Uh, while they have become, however, more systematic and widespread throughout the 40 year long uh, neoliberal transformations. Uh, my analysis today on this question of what is generally called corruption, clientelism or cronism under the AKP rule is based uh, on a fundamental presupposition that there is indeed nothing to be questioned in the very existence of such relations in any capitalist country, including Turkey. As Ellen Wood reminds, even though capitalism is driven by competition, capital always tries to obstruct competition and corruption, clientelism or cronism have been strategies applied to this end uh, during the historical development of uh, capitalism with maybe more professional and uh, complicated versions in the North and more primitive and conventional ones uh, in the South. At another level of analysis, uh, it is also possible to argue that uh, corrupt state capital relations are embedded in the contradictions between the capitalist content and the class neutral formal legal experiential reality uh, of the modern bourgeois state. Having said this, uh, it is still important to question why complaints about corruption uh, have risen since the 1980s, who has cared of this problem, as well as when. In my talk, uh, I will try to answer these questions uh, by focusing on the Turkish case uh, to argue firstly that the rise of corruption as well as anti-corruption calls have been neoliberal governing strategies adopted at some critical conjunctures in sync with the global political agenda. To support this argument, uh, I will briefly overview uh, the clientelistic Özal years in the 1980s, the aftermath of the 2001 economic crisis when the former World, World Bank economist Kemal Dervish claimed to get Turkey over the crisis by putting an end uh, to clientelistic state capital relations. And the most recent years that uh, saw intensifying criticisms of the crony AKP rule from within as well as uh, abroad. My second argument uh, in relation to this uh, critical historical analysis will be that there is a fundamental difference in the political context of cronism of the 1980s and that of the 2010s. This is because neoliberalization processes have substantially enhanced the subordination of social relations by capital in Turkey in between these two decades. I will argue that this subordination has not only redefined state capital relations in the country at the concrete level of analysis, but also institutionalized chronism in the state's new privatized, personalized, and discretionary political form in response to the new class contradictions of Turkey's financialized capitalism. Let me start then uh, with the critical overview of neoliberalization processes within the context of cronism in Turkey. Those early years in Turkey uh, refer to the initial systematic implementation of neoliberal policies in the face of a resistant developmentalist state bureaucracy, which Özal tried to pacify by injecting some neoliberal minded cadres in total disregard of the established merit-based procedures of the state. 
Hence, as they are popularly called so, Özal's U.S. educated princes were brought to manage the state-owned banks of Turkey, which were then used to provide easy credits to business circles close to Özal himself. What is interesting about the rise of clientelism in this period is that, while it was evident to everyone in the country, it did not attract any serious criticism from international financial institutions. Most part, possibly because uh, this was seen as a necessary risk to be taken in order to put uh, the neoliberal agenda into effect. Indeed, uh, conscious implementation of this strategy was going to be made open by the shock therapy advisors in Eastern Europe after about 10 years. While complaining about the opponent coalitions resisting uh, radical market reforms in Eastern Europe, Schleifer and Treisman argued, for instance, that these opponents had to be either expropriated, dissolved, or co-opted through rents. Similarly, Blanchard et al. expressed similar concerns during the Polish privatizations by saying that unless they are appeased, bribed or disenfranchised, privatization cannot proceed. However, uh, besides being a simple controversy between the market reformers and the opponents, this story also reminds us that neoliberals call for level, leveling the playing field for all in the capitalist market has been threatening for many enterprises since the beginning. Those who have not been in a position to take this challenge, obviously. Obviously, neoliberal governments in the 1980s and 90s have responded to these pressures through various strategies, depending on the specificities uh, of different countries. In Turkey, uh, despite Özal's initial hegemonic rise, 1990s turned into the country's so-called lost decade due to the inability of various coalition governments to keep up with the global neoliberal agenda. 1980s and 90s, however, ha however, had also seen the rising indebtedness of the state to finance new business groups, including many small banks, in support of the neoliberal financial liberalizations. When Kemal Darwish was attacking this unchecked lavish period as clientelism after the 2001 crisis and calling for a new period of financial clearance, he was ironically attacking the former neoliberal coalition in Turkey. Hence, uh, by the interventions of Darwish, the 2001 crisis turned out to be the Turkish version of the 1997 East Asian crisis as the crony state capital relations were made the scapegoats instead of the IMF imposed financial liberalization policies and the crisis paved the way for the acceleration rather than deceleration of financial liberalization and re-regulation. What followed SWIFT was a substantial restructuring in the banking sector with many bankruptcies and foreign mergers and acquisitions. Uh, besides, of course, uh, the AKP is coming to power by the help of a corruption-centered election campaign in 2002. It might be argued that a similar but expanded cycle of corruption neoliberal reform has identified the AKP's succeeding protracted rule in Turkey. In its first 11 years of, in power, the AKP implemented the pending neoliberal uh, re reforms rigorously, such as the legislation of social security and labor laws, privatizations of large scale and profitable state enterprises, and the commercialization of agriculture, uh, while managing to establish a hegemonic rule uh, through the distribution of rents in different forms, but all in line with its Islamist political priorities. This success was financed by the global monetary glut prevailing in international markets uh, in these years, in which not only were uh, new crony networks formed, but also the enterprises and households were made heavily indebted by the well-designed AKP policies. 
To the surprise of many critical voices, however, this period was celebrated by the liberal circles in Turkey as well as abroad as the AKP's golden years of democratization with no regard of cronism at all, reminding us the intentional blindness during the Özal years. In other words, uh, the AKP's deepening and consolidation of the neoliberal agenda was considered to be more crucial than the Islamic recomposition of the society through crony networks at different levels. The recent and rather belated recognition of AKP's cronism by the liberals portend now another period of financial clearance the social and political implications of which would be harsher than possibly the earlier one. These criticisms might be interpreted as a search for a new anti-AKP, but still neoliberal compromise. On the other side, the AKP does not seem to bother itself with these criticisms a lot, possibly because it is aware that they don't make sense to an indebted society whose survival is now very much dependent uh, on the continuing recycling of debts and the postponement uh, of the clearance uh, moment, if possible, forever. Indeed, uh, Erdogan has taken all the risks until very recently to be able to do this uh, by keeping the interest rates low as the survival of the indebted masses and the electoral fate of the, electoral fate of the AKP are directly linked to each other now through this what might be called generalized clientelism. The AKP's acceleration of authoritarianism after uh, 2013 and experimentation with a new governing pra practice known as the presidential system of government uh, since July 2018 can be interpreted as strategies to manage the aggravated contradictions of Turkey's financialized capitalism. Turkey's new privatized, personalized, discretionary and coercive political form of state implies that these contradictions can hardly be managed now by the established mother boundaries between state and capital, as well as state and civil society which made me to think that what's going on in contemporary Turkey is the privatization of the state, redefining Beatrice Hibo's liberal institutionalist conceptualization within a Marxist uh, terminology. Thanks. I think our moderator is somehow <laughs> cut. <laughs> Alirza, maybe would you, would you like to just continue? Yeah, I, I believe uh, Doctor Doctor Adam Rural is having some connection problems. So so uh, we can we can move on to the second presentation. Uh, <laughs> and and if if she doesn't show up, I'll keep the time. Uh, yeah, and and uh, Doctor Ergenç, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, let me uh, share my uh, screen and um, have uh, a brief uh, PowerPoint because I might uh, show you guys a couple of uh, graphs uh, about uh, corruption in China. Um, so unlike Turkey, uh, corruption and anti-corruption balls uh, are uh, perhaps among the most hotly uh, debated topics in China. Uh, the anti-corruption uh, during uh, anti-corruption campaign uh, during uh, Xi Jinping's uh, uh, periods uh, took down about one and a half million party members uh, in a party of uh, 90 million and uh, among them uh, about 40, uh, 450 or 500 of them uh, were high level uh, officials. So uh, it, is, uh, it is definitely uh, at the center of uh, the uh, political discourse uh, in China. But of course, the numbers uh, don't mean much uh, uh, if you don't clarify what we mean or how we define uh, corruption. Uh, so uh, let me clarify how I see and how the literature sees uh, corruption in China. Um, so I uh, subscribe to uh, the definition, uh, like Pnar, uh, that um, 
uh, unlike like the, the, li the liberal definition of corruption in which the state is, is assumed to be uh, neutral um, and uh, corruption is a malfunction of uh, the state apparatus, I see it's something inherent to uh, the capitalist, uh, capitalist state formation. And uh, the rest of uh, my presentation, uh, my short uh, uh, introduction topic will uh, be actually framed within, uh, this, uh, within this definition. So going back to the literature, how the, uh, the existing literature defines corruption uh, in China, um, so uh, the, the literature has it that uh, there are two characteristics of corruption in China. One is that it is localized, and the second is that, as, as you can also see uh, from the uh, graph here, that uh, it is uh, about uh, access money, meaning uh, the grafts uh, by uh, the policymakers. So what I, I mean with these two characteristics. It is uh, local in the sense that uh, the top leadership in China and their extended families are not necessarily corrupt in the way that, let's say, like the, 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 uh, the families or oligarchies in the Philippines, for example. But this uh, localized uh, corruption doesn't uh, also mean petty thefts uh, in the form of uh, bribery of uh, the undercompensated uh, local officials, like in India, for example. So we are talking about grant theft, like excess money, the money uh, you know, exchange hands, exchanging hands uh, for um, uh, for the privileges uh, in terms of um, uh, not only money but also uh, uh, legal permissions uh, and uh, and whatnot. Um, but again, uh, it is a bottom-heavy uh, situation that uh, the local governments are uh, at least charged more, uh, indicted uh, with corruption charges more uh, than uh, the upper levels. So. Um, in order to explain how uh, we reach at these uh, two characteristics, like localized uh, access money uh, in China in terms of corruption, I want to do a little bit of a periodization. And um, we discovered uh, when we were talking about that uh, with Kunar that uh, actually uh, there's a lot to talk about this periodization when we compare China and Turkey, but I'll leave it to uh, the discussion session. So um, let me uh, first uh, give you uh, what I want to uh, tell you about uh, the, the, the main uh, uh, turning points uh, and takeaways of this periodization. In, and if time permits, I can go in detail or maybe I can do it uh, during the uh, Q&A session as well. So um, what we see is waves of increased corruption uh, as an activity um, and uh, waves of anti-corruption as a political narrative uh, and also uh, sometimes as an action, as an anti-corruption campaign as well in China's post mark era. Um, so um, uh, the 80s and 2000s are the two uh, periods, uh, decades, that uh, coincide uh, with uh, major economic changes and hence um, uh, corruption uh, were um, allowed, if not encouraged altogether, actually, in order to create a regime supporting uh, economic elites. This 80s is uh, the First initial integration to global capitalist economy, uh, the very early stages of uh, neoliberalism. Um, and in 2000s, as you know, uh, like similar to other parts of the world, uh, financialization of uh, the, uh, the neoliberal uh, regime. Uh, all, uh, also, also in China. And in both uh, cases, we see uh, the emergence of uh, a certain elite. Um, uh, partially thanks to also the corrupt uh, clientelist relations. In the 80s, we see uh, local state uh, corporatism with the decollectivization of the communes and uh, the privatization of uh, uh, the SOEs in urban China later on towards, uh, towards the 90s. And um, uh, the, the, the local elite in uh, the, the, the TVs uh, in uh, rural China and uh, the um, uh, the, 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 the new urban business elites, uh, which are uh, uh, actually standing actually uh, at the intersection of political elite and economic elite, because most of the privatization in China uh, of the SOEs were insider privatization, meaning that uh, all these SOEs were sold uh, to their own managers, or people who had access to these um, uh, insiders thanks to their Guanxi networks. Like It can be either like parochial Guanxi networks, like uh, clan, uh, school, uh, hometown uh, uh, connections, or uh, uh, 
uh, cultivated Guanxi uh, links like bribery, uh, uh, whining and dining, exchange of gifts and favors and what. Right. Um, so uh, these are uh, the two uh, the two periods, and uh, these two periods both are um, uh, followed by um, um, uh, by uh, waves of anti-corruption in 90s and 2010s. And in, in the 90s, it was uh, first uh, because uh, the foreign investors were shying away from China uh, due to the uncertain environment the corruption causes. And also, um, the uh, uh, second half of the 90s, uh, the local government lost its uh, privileged position vis-a-vis -vis the local business elite when the central government um, changed uh, the tax revenue allocations and uh, decided to take all the tax revenues uh, itself for top-down major state projects. Um, uh, when we come to uh, um, uh, 2000s, uh, the local governments uh, uh, find a new way uh, to tip the balance in favor of themselves, again, vis-a-vis -vis the business, local business elites, and um, focus uh, on land speculation. And again, this is not uh, far from what's going on globally anyways, but uh, in, in China's case, land speculation uh, helps the local governments who are, uh, are the sole authority in, um, um, in the rights such as the, the land use and lease rights, and especially uh, the, uh, the right, legal right to change the status of the land from arable uh, to residential uh, lies in the hands of the local governments, which gives them um, uh, a new uh, uh, a refreshed uh, power in uh, the clientelist relations uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the real estate sector uh, and construction uh, sector in particular. Uh, when we come to uh, 2010s, uh, we see Xi Jinping's, uh, 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 as I mentioned, uh, the strike hard anti corruption uh, campaign, um, along with the deepening of neoliberalization, of course, with the segregating social policies and um, um, uh, uh, and all that. Uh, so uh, we see a uh, polarization uh, in the society and uh, the anti-corruption campaign here um, helps, well, helps, you know, enhancing the legitimacy of, uh, of, of the state in the eyes of the society, which I'm going to come in a second, but also um, helps, in my opinion, as like, the, like uh, one of the main arguments of my presentation, helps consolidating uh, a narrower, uh, but more uh, monolithic and coherent uh, dominant class, ruling class, as uh, like a, uh, like a um, um, uh, intersection or merging, even not in, uh, intersection, but merging of uh, economic and political elite in China in order to uh, carry on uh, the uh, central state-led um, uh, economic projects, uh, but such as like innovation uh, and, um, and, and regional development uh, projects. So um, what do I mean uh, with this uh, these are merging of cl uh, classes or uh, well, what classes are we are talking about? Well, actually, we are, I'm talking about uh, different groups uh, within uh, the dominant class uh, in China. And of course, uh, these are not necessarily like uh, 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 cookie cutting, cookie cutter uh, uh, definitions, and they're definitely not uh, black and white uh, categorizations. They overlap a lot. And uh, when they don't overlap, they actually have a really close uh, 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 clientelist uh, links. Uh, so it is pretty much a very gray picture. Um, trying to draw here uh, to give you a heads up. Um, but just to give you an idea, um, uh, we're talking about uh, like transgenerational wealth as a, uh, as a group uh, within the dominant class. Uh, who are they? Uh, for those uh, who speak Chinese, that is what I'm referring to. And these are the ones uh, who acquired their wealth basically during the unregulated economic activities in 80s and 90s. Um, and some of them uh, are closely connected with uh, what I'm going to call the transgenerational power in a second, um, like they are the insiders, but some of them, as I pre previously mentioned, are those who uh, um, enjoy um, um, upward uh, political uh, mobility um, through uh, the, the, the uh, newly est uh, emerging uh, Guanxi relations, basically. 
Then uh, we had the transgenerational power, uh, Guiardai, Guiar uh, which uh, have uh, 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 political power in China uh, it, uh, through several ways. Uh, one uh, prominent way of doing it is uh, uh, belonging to a family that uh, has uh, has uh, uh, transgenerational uh, political power, like those uh, the families of uh, the first generation revolutionaries, uh, the princelings uh, faction uh, within uh, the party uh, uh, is that, or uh, those who belong to uh, local elites. Um, um, or descendants of uh, these uh, local local elites uh, can also uh, be a part of a part of this transgenerational power and the Shanghai clique within the faction uh, the Shanghai clique faction within the party for example is a good example for that um, not all the political power is inherited in China there is still ways of acquiring political power even if you come from an unprivileged background and uh, the uh, thanks to your education and career and the China Youth League uh, faction within the party is a good example for that. So what do these uh, um, uh, different uh, groups of uh, transgenerational power do? Well, they consolidate uh, their power uh, through factional uh, hierarchies within the party. Um, and I was like mentioning all these factions uh, within the party, right? Um, and of course, again, uh, these are not totally separated from uh, the transgenerational wealth either, because uh, these uh, members of the transgenerational power group, these, uh, these political factions within the party themselves or their families, their extended families may actually uh, engage in uh, business transactions with uh, what I call the transgenerational wealth, uh, which uh, you know, uh, makes these uh, two groups uh, interconnected. Then when we come to 2000s, uh, we see the emergence of, of um, new money, let's say, if we can talk about an old money in, in China. Um, this, this new money, in a way, metaphorically speaking, is um, a, a result of uh, the uh, strengthening uh, real estate and finance sectors uh, through the financial urbanization in the uh, 2000s and 2010s. And um, uh, this uh, group um, co um, consolidates its power as a political economic uh, elite uh, through uh, the horizontal connections with uh, the local governments, uh, read the uh, corruption at the local level, right? But also the vertical uh, connections with their patterns uh, at the higher uh, 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 scales of uh, political structure in China. Um, and um, what I'm going to say uh, now is uh, that um, the corruption is uh, shown as, um, as, a, uh, as a horizontal um, uh, malfunction, malfunction of uh, the local states. But actually, um, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, the chart on the right hand side, um, there's uh, both horizontal and uh, vertical connections um, that have the consolidation of this, uh, this, um, this the, the, the dominance uh, class, the ruling elite in China. And uh, what I'm gonna uh, uh, argue right now is that uh, the official narrative on co both corruption, anti-corruption actually hides the fact that um, it has, it's, it's both horizontal uh, at the local level, but also vertical within these uh, factional hierarchies um, within the party as well. So how this, um, um, in a say, in a way, uh, narrative uh, decoupling of the horizontal and um, and vertical uh, uh, connections uh, uh, happens. So. Uh, at the beginning of uh, the post my uh, era, uh, corruption was made a public issue, not by the state, but by the opposition, meaning uh, the uh, dissident liberal intellectuals. Um, what they were saying is that uh, the party state system, system itself is corrupt, uh, inherently corrupt, because it doesn't have uh, checks and balances or other uh, mechanisms that will secure uh, accountability and transparency. And mind that this is a very liberal uh, definition of corruption, right? Like assuming that you know a, a neutral state uh, can be achieved, right? And these uh, these were like you know very devoted uh, liberal uh, intellectuals. Uh, so um, that's you know um, 
that's that's what they did, right? But uh, their arguments uh, about corruption actually uh, became uh, turned out to be one of the main pillars of the Tiananmen protests in '89, uh, which uh, eventually, uh, which in turn uh, resulted in a deep existential uh, threats uh, for the state. And what the state did in response is, well, apart from, of course, uh, violently uh, uh, suppressing the Tiananmen protests, uh, in terms of uh, the framing of the political narratives, um, uh, they uh, responded, uh, the state responded with a counter narrative. And this counter narrative, still valid up until today, it, uh, has it that. Um, uh, it is the local government that is corrupt uh, of the government hierarchy, administrative hierarchies, um, and the central government, which is uh, clean, um, uh, is fighting against it. It is actually an amazing shift um, uh, in uh, uh, the, that the state managed in uh, public perce perceptions of itself, like from uh, the one that commits uh, corruption to the one that fights against, right? Um, uh, sorry to interrupt, so, you, but but the time is up. So that's, uh, that's how now uh, we lose, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll be done. Um, this is actually, this is actually uh, what's, um, uh, what I'm uh, saying. So uh, to come to the conclusion, uh, going back to where I started, uh, to Xi Jinping's anti-corruption uh, uh, campaign. So the, the official narrative of the campaign has it that they uh, target both uh, the flies, meaning the uh, small local officials, and it's like the, uh, their patrons at the local level, at the central level, right? But when you look at uh, the numbers real quick, I promise, Erza, um, if you look at the numbers, um, uh, we see that in all the major industries like real estate and energy and everything, there are more flies uh, indicted than uh, the uh, uh, than the tigers. Um, and uh, in only one exception, in the military, there are more tigers than the former leaders of China. And again, like these two, uh, two uh, graphs also show us that uh, it's always uh, the lower level, upper level officials and uh, and uh, petty theft are uh, prosecuted more than uh, the grand theft and um, higher level officials, which actually um, reinforces uh, my argument presentation uh, that uh, anti-corruption movement uh, is yes used in a, uh, one of the. Uh, uh, Purposes of the anti-corruption movement is obviously to prevent inefficiency caused by uh, the uh, the corruption. Uh, the other one is like eliminating the rival factions. That's also fine. They're all uh, covered by the existing literature. But I also I agree that it's also for consolidating uh, this uh, new class by shedding those coming from diverse backgrounds and who were to the ranks uh, in the in the eighties and nineties and going back to to a more what uh, uh, they think as a more reliable class uh, makeup that can uh, pursue uh, the state-led um, economic projects uh, during the Xi Jinping era. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, so I, this, thank you for this uh, enlightening uh, presentation. So I'll, I'll continue as a step in moderator and and um, and I believe that the the periodization uh, itself and and the and your and your uh, comments on the elite formation as well as the this narrative on the clean let's say central state and and petty corruption in the local state uh, gives a lot to talk on and uh, probably uh, Pnaroja will will comment on these and we'll give. Uh, each presenters around five minutes to reflect on the other presentation. And now the floor is yours. 
Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Aliza, as well as Jeren. Uh, indeed, uh, we exchanged our uh, presentations with Jeren before the uh, before uh, the, this this meeting, and uh, even though we we have not uh, talked to each other in terms of how to uh, prepare our presentations, we were quite uh, astonished with the, with the uh, parallels in terms of these uh, these periods. So uh, it it's quite interesting to see that even though that was something we both were thinking on, uh, it's so clear that corruption seems to be a very important uh, strategy to make some social transformations politically possible in some different periods. As Jeran mentioned, this should not necessarily mean a very well-designed conscious strategy, but it appears to be so, I mean, in terms of political practices. So in, in Turkey, for instance, 1990s uh, was a period of uh, introduction of neoliberal transformations, which necessarily re required putting an end to import substitution integration to global markets with a new export oriented ones, obviously with significant uh, reconfigurations of power uh, within Turkish, uh, Turkish capitalism. Whereas in the 1980s, we see this time, even though within a context of socialist transformation or socialist transition to uh, basically capitalism, uh, we see also fundamental transformations going hand hand in hand with some new uh, corrupt linkages, uh, basically uh, ensured at the local level. Uh, all, again, uh, in Turkey, as well as uh, in, in, in China, 2000 seems to be uh, a corrupt period, quite interestingly, almost uh, in the same sectors. So construction, land speculation were all also the, the the, the, the areas of uh, basically corrupt linkages in Turkey as well. So, I mean, this tells us that there are really significant global processes in the making uh, during all these uh, in overall times. Um, but maybe, uh, I mean, one, the way that we approached uh, to, to corruption may be shifted uh, in a way uh, from each other by Aran's emphasis, by Jeran's emphasis on basically corruption in China as a power consolidation strategy of, of uh, the, the, the Central Communist Party. And obviously, as I understood uh, in China, that uh, process of centralization, decentralization, and particularly the centers, the, the, cent the, the, the Communist Party's attempt to centralize power in its hands has uh, played a significant uh, basically a role in that maybe instrumentalization of uh, corruption or anti-corruption calls uh, in overall. In the, in the Turkish case, I, I tried to underline how indeed corruption has worked uh, as a process that helps uh, capital to centralize and concentrate uh, the centralization and con concentration uh, processes of uh, capital in overall uh, was made possible by a, by a, by a discourse as well as a practice uh, of, of uh, corruption uh, in overall. Um, how, again, quite interestingly, in both in the Turkish case as well as in the, uh, in the Chinese case, we see similar periods uh, as uh, the periods of rise of anti-corruption calls. But uh, quite interestingly, in the Turkish case, we see those calls coming uh, either directly from uh, abroad, from international financial institutions, or basically critics uh, outside of, of, of Turkey. Whereas in the case of China, quite interestingly, this, this process seems to work as a sort of a political consolidation strategy within the Chinese Communist Party, within the Chinese uh, basically political circles. And what I thought uh, it was that, uh, Xi Jinping uh, behaves, I think, or plays the role of the international financial institutions uh, played in Turkey uh, over uh, the local governments, I suppose. What is uh, uh, maybe in the case of Turkey, a sort of a global disciplining process uh, seems to be working as a sort of a domestic disciplining process this time over the uh, over the local uh, let's say uh, politics or local uh, power holders in overall uh, i i i indeed see in both cases um, um, applying to a corruption as a sort of a defensive strategy. Because uh, as I said, for instance, and, and maybe that's also one of the important differences, for instance, 2010s 
has not been a period of, uh, for at least so far, uh, a significant uh, discussion uh, around corruption in Turkey or anti-corruption in Turkey. Recently, there have been some uh, maybe criticisms coming out, but I mean, this is uh, for the moment relatively weak. So even though there is a deep corruption process, deep corruption, uh, let's say, uh, linkage is already established, this seems to be a non-question non in Turkey, except some standard, let's say, political criticisms coming from the oppositional parties. Uh, however, in the case of China, we see uh, a significant uh, use of anti-corruption as an important maybe uh, reconsolidation strategy. I think, but still, I mean, even in the Turkish case and in the Chinese case, these are sort of defensive strategies. Because, uh, I mean, in the Turkish case, obviously, the increased uh, subordination of capital over social relations and particularly the small and medium uh, scale enterprises uh, in Turkey, particularly financial capital, seems to be creating a significant uh, maybe reproduction problem, both for the AKP uh, government, but as well as the state, uh, as well as the society in overall. So uh, those clientelistic crony-like relations seems to be a sort of a reaction to that subordination on the side of at least the AKP and its, uh, its uh, close, uh, let's say, client clientelistic links. However, in the case of China, possibly this was a sort of a preparation maybe uh, for China's, uh, in a sense, integration to financialize capitalism because Obviously, uh, China seems to be relatively more, uh, let's say, powerful uh, in terms of uh, cap in terms of maybe avoiding the financial crisis that Turkish capitalism has 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 has, has faced recently, because China. Uh, uh, has been integrated to global markets more through uh, basically uh, more through uh, the, the industrial capital, more through the, 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 the real, uh, real economy linkages. Uh, so, but, but obviously, uh, if China will play the role of a hegemon, obviously, uh, it has to be capable of also uh, playing the financial uh, or be, be powerful also in the financial uh, in, in the financial field as well, or maybe at least uh, not to be vulnerable because in terms of the financialization processes, I think there is a clear, uh, let's say, a priority or a prevalence of, of the United States in the financial markets in comparison uh, to China. So possibly China uh, plans to take the challenge to a degree, but wants to basically uh, strengthen its, its back, wants to, wants to basically prepare itself for that uh, much, much deep financial integration. That's what I, what I got. So otherwise, I mean, uh, uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party's persistent attempt for centralization uh, by such an indeed uh, harsh attack on the local rulers seems to be uh, quite uh, extreme for me. I don't know <laughs> that these are my comments uh, from outside to, to China. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, let me remind to the participants that they can start typing their questions into the Q&A box. Um, either, either Dr. Eren Vural or myself will be reading those questions. And so we can, we can move on to our second speaker for her reflections and comments. Thank you. Um, well, as Pnar said, uh, both presentations reveal that there are considerable similarities between the periodization of corruption narratives in China and Turkey. Um, and uh, like roughly speaking, the 80s uh, and the, uh, the 2000s are very similar, right? The initial stages of neoliberalization and the financialization of it. Um, and uh, corruption plays an important role in consolidating the elites who will execute the new economic programs in these, uh, in these decades. And then again, uh, similarly, in the 90s, uh, we witnessed uh, the rise of anti-corruption narrative in both countries. And Pnar says that it is mostly uh, due to uh, the international pressure on Turkey, um, whereas in the, in the Chinese case, of it, uh, it looks uh, more like, uh, like an 
you know, uh, from within. Uh, but uh, I guess um, we can, we can, we can uh, come back to that. Uh, but the, the interesting question is uh, when we come to uh, 2010s, um, the anti-corruption rhetoric totally disappears from the official language in Turkey, while it, is, it has become one of the core aspects of the political leadership in China. Um, and uh, I want to add one more dimension to here that uh, it is uh, the 2010s, uh, this decade, uh, sees an authoritarian turn uh, in uh, both countries with the presidential system in Turkey, uh, politically speaking, and the constitutional amendments in China. Uh, both happened in the same year, in 2018. Um, and uh, for the constitutional amendments in China, uh, this was not only the elimination of the term limit of Xi Jinping, but also an extreme uh, recentralization of decision making powers in the hands of the Politburo and not even Politburo, but Xi Jinping himself, basically. Uh, so the, the constitutional amendments were for that. So it is very comparable in my mind uh, to uh, the presidential system in Turkey. Um, so how do we explain uh, this difference? Um, so I like it when Pnar says uh, under uh, the AKP rule, uh, the clientelist uh, relations uh, were generalized to make up for the, especially in the, in the, in, uh, in the later decades, to make up for the indebtedness of uh, the various segments of the society. Um, in contrast, it seems like in China, the new generation of SOEs, uh, the SOEs that act like private uh, MNCs, uh, and the top-down innovation uh, policies uh, concentrate the political economic elite coalition to those who have a certain background. Um, consequently, the anti-corruption uh, campaign was used to legitimize such narrow class consolidation uh, and leaving out those who were once in the club. Um, in contrast, uh, the generalized uh, clientelism uh, in Turkey, in Pnar's words, uh, makes such authorization, if I may, not feasible uh, for the government because, uh, again, uh, going back to Pnar's analysis, uh, in comparison to the Chinese uh, state, the Turkish state is not strong enough uh, to, uh, in the face of uh, the, uh, the uh, new crises basically, plus uh, the uh, pressures uh, from uh, the, uh, the international uh, institutions. Um, so yeah, I see uh, the, the major, uh, major difference uh, here. And uh, uh, maybe I'll use one more minute uh, to use the benefit of um, speaking after Punar, uh, now being the second speaker. Uh, I'm going to respond uh, to a couple of points she made. Um, centralization of capital uh, is more visible uh, in Turkey uh, than in uh, China, uh, she said. Um, I, uh, hmm. I think there is centralization of capital uh, in China too, uh, in terms of these like new SOEs and uh, all these like uh, uh, the central uh, central state led uh, innovation uh, uh, policies and everything are actually uh, a sign of uh, centralization of capital. But of course, Ch uh, China is much more uh, decentralized country in terms of administrative uh, hierarchies. So yeah, there, like for example, yeah, uh, even for BRI like Belt and Road Initiative. The Chinese central state has to rely on uh, city level uh, SOEs uh, uh, for uh, the overseas uh, investments. So in this sense, um, uh, China's uh, uh, concentration of capital looks um, uh, more decentralized given uh, the administrative uh, decentralization, um, I think. Um, and um, in terms of uh, integration into financialized uh, capitalism, um, again, I, uh, on the one hand, uh, agree uh, with uh, uh, uh comments uh, that China is in a much better position uh, for that, and also express desire to do so, basically, uh, in, 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 in official discourse. Um, but uh, um, we see, interestingly, uh, this anti-corruption uh, uh, campaign hitting uh, the, uh, uh, the financial elite who are trying to uh, do this uh, global integration 
information by themselves without uh, the uh, permission, in a way, of uh, of the state. Like there's an example of in 2017, the, the Ambang Insurance Company, uh, which uh, was actually trying to uh, have uh, partnerships with the Trump family uh, back then, and this, this coincides with like the Trump-China relations around that time, and. Um, uh, as soon as they criticize the central state uh, for not allowing the private capital uh, 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 outflows, um, uh, they were uh, sacked by a um, uh, rapid uh, corruption uh, blow. And now there's no such thing as Amman insurance company, basically. So again, this, is, this goes back to my point of um, the, 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 the financial elites uh, uh, can only survive if they are uh, uh, in, an, uh, in a merger with the political elite, basically, if they are endorsed uh, by the pol if they are acting together with the, with the political elites. Um, with that, I think I'm going to stop and I'm sure we're going to have um, a lot of questions or we ho I hope we're going to have a lot of questions and we can continue with that. Uh, so, um, so the, our participants can can type in their questions. Uh, as I said, I'll be I'll be uh, posing them to our uh, presenters. Uh, so, um, let me let me start by asking my own question while waiting waiting for for others to write. Uh, and and this goes goes to both of you. Um, in in Turkey, we pay like a kind of an undeserved attention to grand projects, public-private partnerships, and the corruption um, that is embedded within the contracts of these mega projects. Um, so uh, can, can we make a kind of a comparison of the Turkish case with um, on, on the basis of this, let's say, public-private partnership corruption with other other cases and i mean have you have you uh, thought about the this dimension and of course uh, do we have a kind of i mean I, I understand that because of the because of paying attention to the local state level let's say corruption this is not the case in china but um, has, has there been a kind of a discussion about the um, real estate corruption in, in those grand projects um, associated with, for example, Belt and Road Initiative contracts? Has there been such a kind of a discussion in China? That is my question. And let me, uh, if you want, we have, we have two more questions and I can, uh, I can also read them. So the first question is by Jemal Balaman and it goes to Dr. Bedirhanoğlu. Uh, he asks, uh, do you analyze public-private cooperation partnership models for hospitals, bridges, and etc., as a case of clientelism in Turkey, a similar one to the one I asked. And we have a question from uh, an, another participant, uh, and I believe this may, this may be directed to both of you. Um, can we say the post-2013 period of AKP as the period of institutionalization of corruption? Um, I mean, rather than using a term such as chronic capitalism, can we use the term institutionalization of corruption? Uh, and, and we can start with uh, Dr. Bedrenoğlu. Okay. Um, I mean, we can definitely call uh, uh, PPPs, public-private partnerships, uh, as uh, fields or sites of corruption, clientelism, cronism, definitely. And uh, in these in these uh, practices, uh, obviously, uh, both the domestic capital and the, the international capital, most of the time just uh, go hand in hand. But I have to say, uh, I mean, I try to avoid uh, cor analysis of corruption uh, through such practices, uh, not simply because, uh, I mean, I, I, not, not, not I try to avoid this or I just neglect those corrupt uh, practices, but 
uh, it is pr pr practically quite hard to, 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 to really research in this. So, I mean, you can't just go beyond, uh, for instance, newspaper analysis uh, in terms of uh, clarifying, I mean, what's going on in between the, the state as well as with those uh, business groups. So, uh, I, I personally avoid uh, making analysis at that level because I think it's it's very clear and uh, let's say uh, not unexpected to me uh, the, the existence of such 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 practices because I I try to uh, work on corruption really as a sort of a, a political process as a as a as a specific political process of state uh, transformation quite uh, clearly working very or basically making significant uh, co contributions to the implementation of neoliberal uh, transformations in overall so uh, in that sense uh, obviously ppps are fields that uh, those chronic uh, relations are directly established but um, I personally don't make research uh, on them in detail. I mean, except uh, reading the, the newspaper and trying to follow what sort of connections are going uh, through. Uh, post 2010s, I mean, I, I, I think at some point called them also institutionalizational corruption. In this talk, I, I, I developed a new concept saying that there is now a generalized clientelism, not simply in I mean, meaning that not simply in between uh, state and some specific selected, uh, let's say, uh, capital groups, but also I think uh, the overall uh, reproduction of the society under conditions of financialization seems to uh, establish a sort of a new relationship between the state and the capital. I mean, sorry, the state and society, because it appears that now, uh, I mean, under the current level of financialization in Turkey, the, the masses, the people, the, the companies in overall uh, seems to be first, seem to be first uh, disciplined by the violence of finance, by the violence of indebtedness. And it appears that the state uh, in, in such uh, moments enter into the picture as a sort of a uh, saver of last re resort. So, uh, in a sense, uh, the relationship in between the state and 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 the people, indebted com uh, companies and the indebted uh, households in in overall, seems to be now in a, a, a more of a of a sort of a hierarchical relationship. Because I mean, the state appears as a, a saver uh, to these people, and I think uh, until recently, that's what I really tried to underline in my talk. I think um, Erdogan, in specific, was uh, quite clearly uh, following such a strategy of trying to uh, avoid, for instance, high interest rates in order not to really. Uh, at least force the, the AKP poor electorates into the risk of uh, total bankruptcy, for instance. So I think uh, uh, that's what I particularly, I mean, mean by by that generalized clientelism at the at the society level. So I think it, maybe that's I, maybe we can talk with Jeran. I don't know if similar trends are watched in, in in the in the Chinese case, but that's why the Turkish state structure seems to be going quite uh, pre-modern <laughs> in the sense of uh, basically a state now uh, having a sort of a hierarchical relationship between the society and uh, I mean the state, the the the, the companies and the state. So. Um, I think, uh, I mean, particularly the, the, the level of Turkish capitalism's vulnerability or, in, or Turkish economy's vulnerability in financialization uh, seems, to be, uh, seems to be pushing uh, the Turkish state into a much more defensive position. Maybe, uh, I mean, that, that, that's not that, that uh, strict in the case of China. So, Eran? Ipek is yes. back again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm successfully missed uh, most of the uh, discussions. Uh, my connection is back. Um, and um, I do have my uh, questions if there is time, but I have also noticed that there are um, some questions in the Q&A. Um, so I'm just um, 
posing this first question, uh, which is for um, uh, Jeran Arganj. Um, I'm reading it out loud. Uh, when corrosion in China is localized, other than local sectors of the government, should public institutions such as public schools and hospitals be also held accountable on this issue of corruption, as doctors and teachers often regarded as public servants because of their welfare, social status and authority? Bribery or red pockets for doctors and teachers became part of the tradition in the recent years. Do you think it relates to the larger capital and state development? Jeran? Oh. Did we lose Jeran? I think so, yes. This time her connection is cut. Um, okay, let know. me uh, just uh, continue with the next question because this question is for both of you. I wonder that the relationship between corruption and authoritarianism in finance dominated neoliberalism. Do they feed each other in the neoliberal era or not? If yes, how do you construct this relation? Secondly, in your presentations, you focus upon corruption in terms of structuring state capital owned classes. But if we approach this problem, uh, state society relations from below, how the corruption as a part of political transformation, how the relation between the state and subaltern classes is transformed. This is this question is for both of you, uh, but Jaren is back. Um, so, Jaren, have you been able to hear my question? Can no, you ask me? Yeah. Can I just read the question out loud again? Did one of the written questions? Oh, there is no open questions. Um, okay. Um, okay. So, there so are two which... open questions. Shall I read it back to you or can you see it? I, I can't see it, but I think I read them before. One was about uh, developed countries, right? Like how about Australia, Japan, and US? No, this is about uh, local sectors and their role um, in uh, corruption in China. Uh, this one is more at the level of the um, civil servants or welfare workers, uh, doctors and teachers and how they relate to the relationship between the state and capital in the process of corruption. Um, basically, um, our, um, uh, our audience is asking uh, how uh, corruption at the local level, at the level of welfare services relate to corruption at the broader level in terms of the relations between capital and the state. So how can we ex explain the per pervasiveness uh, of these quote unquote corrupt relations at the lower levels of public service? Okay, um, thank you. That actually this question allows me to um, respond to Aliriza's question too, um, that I couldn't get a chance to answer about the PPP. So I'm gonna combine uh, these two questions. Uh, in my mind at least, so I hope uh, they are uh, linked <laughs> for you too. Um, so Aliriza's question was about uh, the PPPs and if we see any corruption uh, in this. Uh, and he, his question was actually more about the real estate sector, um, uh, but the PPPs are used in China and I guess elsewhere as well um, for uh, uh, delegating outsourcing uh, the welfare provision uh, as well. And um, we see, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, we see more uh, corruption in uh, the, uh, the outsourcing of our welfare services, like the healthcare, elderly care, child care, uh, transportation uh, kind, of, uh, kind of services. Um, uh, whereas in, uh, in, in real estate, um, I mean, again, uh, it is like uh, a bit difficult to generalize when it comes to uh, local China's uh, local Chinese governance. But uh, my uh, one of my recent field works in my uh, re field work um, 
I found out uh, that uh, the PPPs in the real estate sector actually works against uh, the private real estate companies. So uh, the local uh, states, uh, well, uh, uh, under uh, the, um, uh, the orders of the central state is using PPPs actually in a way to contain uh, the bubble and uh, the, the corruption of uh, the real estate state uh, real estate companies, for example, uh, forcing them to uh, to build uh, public housing, affordable housing uh, projects uh, next to uh, next to their uh, communities and, and everything. Um, so I think in the real estate sector is uh, slightly different. Uh, it is more to control uh, the private sector rather than being involved in corruption together. But in the uh, uh, going back to the, the welfare provision uh, thing, um, yes, I think uh, as far as I follow the social policy making in China, uh, we see uh, that PPPs, PPPs are conducive uh, to uh, to corruption through uh, outsourcing of these services to certain. Um, uh, uh, certain uh, private uh, uh, actors uh, with political connections. Um, and uh, within uh, that uh, uh, context, we can talk about the corruption of um, uh, local officials like civil servants, doctors, teachers, uh, and whatnot. Um, that if, uh, in a way, uh, these uh, lower level uh, officials, um, like teachers in public schools and whatnot, are involved in these like outsourcing, these PPP interactions, then uh, yes, we can talk about uh, the uh, the corruption of the uh, of the uh, local level officials and in the welfare sector, but um, still, like petty theft, like bribery uh, by the lower officials, is not as rampant um, in China as it is in India, for example. And it's because um, uh, of the again the stru this structure of the macro economy. The, the Indian economy is mostly dependent on the informal uh, economy, um, whereas in uh, in China uh, the, the bribery uh, exchanging hands uh, by this very lower level uh, public servants like doctors or uh, teachers um, are not uh, systemic, in my opinion. I mean. I'm sure it looks uh, very systemic when you're actually uh, the uh, the parent who has to bribe the, the teacher, like who has to pay for uh, extra uh, classes and whatnot. Uh, but like when we look at the macro uh, level uh, um, factors, um, uh, China's corruption uh, should not be characterized as a petty uh, petty theft type of uh, corruption. Uh, it's not like speed money, like bribery, but it's more excess money, in my opinion. Um, okay, so I would uh, thank you very much for that response. Uh, I would also think that um, the volume is also also matters. Um, I mean, given the large size of the Chinese economy, uh, the extent of uh, petty theft versus um, grant uh, theft was it grant theft or uh, what was the uh, term that we? Yeah, so um, that also, I, I believe, would make um, a difference. Uh, and also, I would think that the different uh, forms of service provision, um, education systems and healthcare systems and the particulars uh, of um, social expenditures in the two contexts uh, may also be the basis for the variation uh, that we can see in social service provision between uh, India versus uh, China. I'm, I'm talking on the example that um, you have provided. Um, there is the second question uh, that applies to both, uh, both of you guys. Um, so this is um, about, um, this uh, participant is asking about the relationship that both of you are establishing between uh, corruption and authoritarianism. Uh, so she's, uh, or he is wondering about the relationship between corruption and authoritarianism in finance dominated neoliberalism. Do you think that they feed each other in the neoliberal era or not? Uh, if yes, how do you construct this relationship? I think the question concerns the, uh, the line of causality uh, between uh, corruption and authoritarianism 
in finance the uh, dominated neoliberalism what feeds what um, sort of a question this is the first question and then there is another one that maybe you would like to go uh, for this one Jeram, uh, maybe you should go first and then can I I agree with uh, with the statements. Um, I often uh, do a uh, comparative analysis, and uh, uh, my like starting premise uh, is that um, the uh, the political regime is not an independent variable. Um, it is actually, um, um, but the, the, there are so many. Uh, uh, we can make uh, comparisons um, across uh, different uh, political regimes, and uh, the. Um, the categorization such as electoral, non-electoral systems, for example, uh, is not necessarily uh, a meaningful one, uh, in, at least in some uh, topics, in some aspects. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the regime or the political structures uh, of um, global or macro level um, um, uh, political economic uh, relations, uh, social relations. Um, and, in, uh, and that's why, um, for example, in our presentation, uh, corruption in an electoral and non-electoral uh, case uh, uh, look actually uh, quite uh, similar. And uh, we have not even mentioned uh, the differences in the political regimes in our presentations about being an electoral and a non-electoral system, because at least I think um, uh, uh, it is uh, not one of the most uh, important uh, factors explaining, um, explaining the uh, differences and similarities. We have, um, uh, we have identified other factors, uh, such as uh, the impact of the, uh, the global uh, neoliberal uh, 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 um, uh, paradigm and um, and uh, the the crises within the nation states, right? Again, regardless of uh, the regime type, and um, and uh, the the class relations, the class formations and class relations. Uh, so, again, in short, I agree with uh, the uh, the question askers uh, that uh, what we observe in um, uh, in the in the in the states, in the modern states, regardless of the regime type, is you know, as a consequence of uh, the global paradigm, yeah. Pranar, for the same question. Um, indeed, I want to answer that uh, question on finance, corruption, and authoritarianism uh, by maybe uh, going back to the very, very early stages of neoliberalism. If you remember, neoliberalism uh, rose to prominence by a, by a claim that uh, the states were going to be relatively limited in terms of their interventions in the market. At least that was the motto of neoliberalism at the very beginning. Uh, however, uh, even uh, in the 1980s, 90s, uh, the, the consistency or uh, basically the appropriateness of such a claim uh, uh, was questioned even by various liberal institutionalist uh, writers at that time because quite interestingly if we think that uh, indeed all these neoliberal transformations including financial liberalization privatization or re-regulation deregulation etc uh, they have been all conducted by the states themselves okay so the states themselves were expected to uh, implement some strategies to ultimately limit themselves was indeed itself a sort of a initial uh, controversy, initial contradiction. But besides this, I think that specific role attached to the states themselves in, in implementing neoliberalization strategies have allowed the states a larger room for maneuver in the process of deciding who would, because I mean, in overall, uh, neoliberalization processes ultimately uh, asked for increased competition in, in all countries, if if fully implemented, okay. So it's mostly dependent on the, it became dependent on states to decide who would face the the, 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 the challenges of harsh competition and who would be uh, maybe roughly uh, saved or maybe protected out of the harshness of competition. Obviously, corruption came uh, uh, comes to the agenda when the states uh, started play. Uh, make, I mean, uh, fulfilling this mission, not on a public basis, 
but uh, by prioritizing some private connections rather than applying general public uh, policies, prioritizing uh, public uh, private connections. Um, I think it might be quite interesting to see how in these neoliberal uh, transformation periods, maybe different uh, parties like, for instance, the, the Islamist AKP uh, has managed to combine the neoliberal, the advantages, the opportunities provided by the neoliberalization processes to states together with their much more specific political concerns. I think, uh, I mean, it might be naive simply to think that uh, the political parties, uh, I mean, maybe th this, this wouldn't be a big problem for the conventional established parties, but a, 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 a party like the AKP with definitely an Islamist agenda, okay, or maybe, maybe uh, some some uh, other much more revisionist parties, like trying to fundamentally change the system, would find uh, quite important rooms for maneuver to, to, to combine their uh, practices together with, with the availabilities, opportunities of neoliberal transformation processes. Indeed, in the case of Turkey, that's what I was trying to also emphasize in many respects. Uh, but in the case of finance, corruption, and authoritarianism, at least in the recent history, in the recent uh, decades, let's say, I think uh, when we look at uh, the financialization process, particularly in the AKP's first period, um, in that period, uh, corruption, called clientelism or cronism, uh, whatever you would like to call it, uh, did not become that ap apparent in overall because uh, it was a period of uh, quite uh, monetary glut in international markets. So uh, in overall, the AKP managed to, for instance, provide different uh, rents in overall uh, to, uh, to, 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 to some selected so-called green companies. But in the meantime, uh, in overall, for instance, uh, in, by the help of uh, indebtedness, by the help of persistently recycling debts, the average uh, life quality of, of the people including the so-called middle classes or the, I mean, much poorer sections of the society did not deteriorate despite the implementation of neoliberal reforms. I think this connection, finance, corruption, authoritarianism started to become much more clear, particularly when the money international mark in international markets started to uh, basically decline because the stakes had to be now uh, maybe redistributed and particularly the state's role in terms of, for instance, uh, providing restructuring to some companies, but not some others, okay? So that selective role of the state uh, has become much more important than ever. I mean, in particularly in times of crisis, particularly in a country like Turkey with full, uh, with, with high financial vulnerability in overall. So um, I think, uh, we, we, we need, we'll start talking about that linkage in between finance, corruption, and authoritarianism uh, much, uh, much more uh, in, in the coming, uh, let's say, years, I suppose. Yes, um, I, I also um, think that, um, yes, there are some um, uh, parallelisms in the current context between financialization and authoritarianism, but uh, rather the relation between authoritarianism and the economic system very much relates to the intensification of uh, social struggles and uh, contradictions that we see throughout the um, capitalist restructuring process, whether uh, it's a financialized uh, restructuring process or whether it's a liberalized uh, restructuring process, we tend to see the links between authoritarianism getting stronger when the contradictions within the uh, different social classes intensify that we see uh, greater um, uh, use of authoritarianism. Um, there is a second part to this question, and I'm just um, voicing that now. If corruption is a part of political transformation, uh, how is the relationship between the subaltern classes and the state is transformed along the way? Again, this is a question for both of you. Uh, 
Uh, Pinar, would you like to have a go first? Um, this time? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm the emphasis is not about the dominant classes, but rather uh, the dominated, the subaltern classes and the state. Uh, I think we need to answer this question again within the context of financialization because uh, not only uh, the question is directly uh, connected to each other in that way, but also uh, that may be one of the important uh, defining characteristics of, uh, of financialization in, in, the, in the last two decades. Um, has been the, the, the high indebtedness of, of, uh, of the, uh, let's say, uh, poor sections of the societies in overall. I mean, uh, I think that uh, by the financial, financial deepening processes of neoliberalism, which became quite clear uh, in the, after 2000s, now uh, uh, masses of people around the world uh, have been now facing uh, the, the discipline of not simply uh, markets in terms of finding a wage, finding a job to simply uh, uh, ensure their subsistence, but they are now forced to also get credits. So in a sense, the market violence over them seems to be uh, in a sense uh, ag aggravated or almost doubled, uh, turned out to be a real market violence in many ways. So I think that 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 makes in overall subaltern cl classes uh, more vulnerable than ever in terms of their uh, capability of meeting their subsistence. So quite interestingly, maybe that's that that's that that is something that needs to be really carefully researched uh, now, because uh, throughout I mean from from roughly uh, 2001 to 2013, uh, I mean 2001 referring to the dot-com crisis in the United States and uh, 2013 referring to the uh, US uh, Federal Reserve's putting an end to expansionary monetary policies. So quite interestingly, from 2001 to 2013, for about almost uh, 12 years long period, in all over the world, uh, possibly in varying degrees, uh, neoliberal gov governments um, uh, almost, I mean, has started uh, making their uh, particularly relatively poorer sections of their societies to become indebted. So uh, in a sense, um, we have seen the, 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 the expansion of uh, financial violence to much wider, uh, let's say, sections of the societies. The, the end of this monetary expansionism uh, inevitably requires now a, a reconfiguration of, uh, let's say, uh, internal domestic uh, relations in terms of how, what sort of policies would the states uh, basically um, start uh, implementing in terms of dealing with that significant challenge, okay? I mean, I, I tend to, for instance, when I look at the Turkish case, what I see is that uh, the, the AKP as an Islamist party has, has uh, enjoyed this opportunity to substantially, I think, redefine the Turkish uh, basically class dynamics, class balances within the Turkish case. I mean, that requires also obviously another long political and sociological discussion on how uh, mostly the, the subaltern classes uh, have been co-opted uh, or kept pacified within Turkish capitalism in the modern, I mean, since the, the, the establishment of the Republic through various processes. But I think the AKP quite interestingly uh, reflected its, its radical character by in a sense behaving quite uh, courageous in terms of substantially de and recomposing laboring classes in Turkey. They're redefining their integration to the to, to, to the to the to the Turkish politics etc I think in that sense uh, now uh, I mean the post uh, 2013 period that's why it has been 
uh, it has become a much harsher period in terms of move to authoritarianism in Turkey. I mean, obviously we have been uh, defining the period before 2013 also authoritarianism, but what we see is an acceleration of authoritarianism after 2013. And I, I, I tend to explain this more by the AKP's such uh, maybe uh, such um, uh, quite careless intervention. I mean, I, I'm not sure if any other conservative government in Turkey would have gone that far in terms of redefining the class balances in Turkey, but that's obviously another story not related directly to corruption. Ceren, would you care to comment? Um, sure, yeah, I'm gonna start uh, with uh, China and then I'm gonna link my comments uh, to, uh, to Pnar's comments and compare with uh, Turkey a little bit, hopefully. Um, well, I'm not that hopeful about uh, the, uh, this, uh, the subaltern classes in China either, um, because uh, with, especially with the, uh, the uh, 2000s onwards, with uh, the increasing precarity of uh, the, uh, the working class, informality of work teams, uh, and, and uh, related as a consequence, uh, the indebtedness um, of uh, the subaltern classes really disperse uh, the working class uh, as an organized uh, force uh, in China. And uh, Xi Jinping's uh, new rule of law idea also uh, helped this uh, dispersion, in my opinion, because now um, individual, um, um, individual uh, uh, right advocacy uh, is encouraged uh, at the expense of uh, organized interest representation, basically. Um, so um, as a result of like these um, uh, uh, these um, conditions, uh, the working class uh, in China is quite dispersed. Actually, going back to like the previous uh, question about the regime times, uh, the urban scholar uh, Fu Long Wu has um, has a saying which I like about China. Actually, he says that uh, don't call a uh, China as an authoritarian state uh, in an uh, ahistoric way, it has become or made uh, authoritarian with uh, neoliberalism. Before that, in Mao era, it was a totalitarian society, like a revolutionary mobilization, everything, but it became authoritarian in the neoliberal era because the states, um, well, uh, the, uh, as there is, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the state has to use political controls uh, to, um, um, to keep the subaltern uh, classes uh, from reacting to class polarization uh, in the society. And that's what uh, makes uh, the Chinese society authoritarian, he says. So yeah, uh, the subaltern, uh, there's class polarization and uh, the subaltern classes uh, are uh, um, not organized and uh, dispersed as a, um, um, as a class, basically. Um, but, um, if we compare it with uh, Turkey, um, like as just uh, 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 Pnar said, uh, the uh, generalized uh, clientelism uh, divides the class lines uh, in Turkey. And if we um, uh, talk about like the dispersal of uh, the working class as an organized entity, it's uh, it's the making of uh, the state itself, like these the selective coalition making uh, across uh, across the class lines. Whereas in China, what happens is a, a result of uh, neoliberalization, basically like precarity and the segregating uh, social policies, uh, informality and whatnot, and indebtedness, like the financialization. Um, so that affects all the subaltern uh, classes in the same way, in a way. So you know, yeah, even though they are not currently uh, an organized entity, um, uh, incapable of organized interest uh, advocacy representation, um, this still keeps them together as a uh, as a whole as an entity, right? And I think the Chinese uh, government, central government, is also aware of uh, this potential threats uh, coming from subaltern classes. That um, besides uh, the political controls, uh, they are also working on a huge poverty alleviation program, especially for rural China, which constitutes still uh, the majority of the population in terms of uh, like. Um, 
uh, unconditional loans or direct financial aids, subsidies and whatnot. Um, so I think uh, Chinese uh, states uh, threat perception from the subaltern classes is more than uh, the Turkish state as of now. Okay, um, so there is a direct question to you, Jeran, uh, and the question is, um, is there a general anger against corruption in China? Um, yeah, that's a good question. This goes was back to like how we define or what type of corruption uh, does China have? Um, um, yes, there's a general anger uh, towards uh, corrupt officials, and unfortunate for uh, the top leadership, it is directed uh, both against the local officials and uh, the uh, the top leadership too a little bit. Um, but uh, it is not uh, um, it is not as strong as uh, like I'm going to compare with India again. <laughs> um, like in India, for example, corruption, the petty uh, corruption was uh, such a uh, level that uh, an anti-corruption uh, social movement, the Hazara movement uh, in 2010s, were able to actually organize itself into a political party and won uh, the Delhi Assembly uh, elections with a landslide victory. Like they got like 98 out of 100 uh, seats there. Um, so, like anti-corruption has such a power in India. In China, as I as I said, like uh, earlier in my presentation, uh, the anger is uh, mostly directed towards uh, the local governments and uh, within a political narrative that uh, it is not uh, inherent in the system, um, but uh, a malfunction of the system. And when these like few rotten apples are cleaned from the system, then everything is okay with the overall uh, overall party state system in China. Okay. Um, so there is um, another question and uh, I have to say, this is uh, one of my favorites. Um, does neoliberalism need powerful authority leadership or leaders to flourish? Should I take? The... Yeah, you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think uh, it, it's not only that neoliberalism needs powerful authority, but I think uh, despite its uh, maybe uh, apparent call for a, for a limited state, uh, neoliberalism uh, has been calling for a strong state since the beginning. I mean, if you have a look at, for instance, the writings of Hayek uh, or the const new constitutionalist uh, arguments of Buchanan, in overall, uh, those, I mean, I don't know if they call themselves neoliberals, but I mean, those, those uh, uh, basically politicians, philosophers who have inspired neoliberalism in overall uh, seem, seem to have quite big problem with particularly the democracy of, of uh, in overall uh, in, 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 in capitalist societies or the democratic character of the modern states in overall. They were very much concerned about the ma majorities capability of influencing basically uh, private uh, some some uh, relatively minority like private interests uh, which obviously they tend to define as individual freedoms but ultimately that they turned out to be specifically powerful class interests in in the societies so i mean it has always been a problem of of those neoliberal minded uh, philosophers uh, uh, to 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 try to develop a strong state to be capable of uh, imposing uh, the the interests of the minority over the majority. Okay, so in that sense, the neo neoliberals call for leveling the playing field in terms of competition for everyone. Definitely, is a call for uh, the much more powerful capitalist groups to have much bigger role within the capitalist markets, centralizing, uh, concentrating their, their power. So in a sense, eating up the small companies, uh, leading to a much uh, bigger uh, subordination over labor, etc. So neoliberalism, by its call for a so-called free market, it's still a, 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 a quite um, power-induced market anyway, but I mean, it's called for a, a free market was definitely a calling for a conflict, more conflicts, more conflictual uh, relations, as well as 
more exploitation for all societies. So neoliberalism since the beginning has been calling for a strong state to manage this. I mean, in that sense, it's it's not that it needs, but it's directly the, the class project itself, I, I suppose. Vera, would you like to comment? I totally agree with that. I, mean, I don't have much uh, to, okay. to add, but just like, um, uh, again, like uh, like uh, uh, political authoritarianism is not a distortion of uh, of the neoliberal project. It was inherent in it uh, from uh, from the very beginning. Um, uh, of course, there might be uh, uh, individual differences across uh, countries or or periods uh, in uh, in one country. Like one leader or a political party may choose to uh, solve uh, the social contradiction, social discontent, not through uh, like bare uh, uh, political violence or like physical violence by the police, but with uh, increasing uh, the channels of uh, participatory governance and, uh, and whatnot. That's possible. Like in China, for example, Hu Jintai, even though 2000s were like the decade that financial liberal, uh, liberal, uh, neoliberalization happened, he was also a leader who uh, 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 institutionalized collective leadership in China and like open channels of participatory governance within the neoliberal framework, of course. Um, uh, so there might there might be like these kind of uh, differences um, across uh, leaders or uh, or governments, but uh, I agree with Punar that um, uh, political authoritarianism is inherent to the neoliberal project. Yeah. Yeah, that also reminds me um, of the distinction that uh, Jessup once drew uh, between inclusive hegemony and exclusive uh, hegemony. And he used to refer to the periods, um, the uh, post-World War era as inclusive hegemony because it integrated uh, different uh, class, um, class sections into um, around a compromise and provided lots of concessions to be able to cement uh, that uh, class alliance, whereas uh, the concessions to be distributed and the class groups to be cemented in the neoliberal er era uh, was not uh, extensive. So the, the hegemony itself was very much exclusive and that exclusion was to a large extent realized through force. So uh, neoliberal um, policies do require strong leadership, uh, not only in a late capitalist context, uh, such as the ones that we are uh, discussing today, but also in uh, more uh, developed uh, capitalist contexts, such as the United Kingdom, for example, uh, or the United States. Um, okay, so I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just I want to mention uh, we have this webinar. It's a shared webinar license. We have it reserved until till twelve thirty, um, and it's well past that now. If we go too long, we might get kicked off. So right. anyway, um, I I'm sorry to interrupt. I think we could continue with a very interesting and lively discussion for a long time. Um, I'll let you finish up your your thought. Hopefully, we won't get kicked off. Um, but we... well, I think uh, this is all finished because we now have um, completed the um, answers, uh, yeah. all answers. Okay. And, um, so this completes our discussion for today. And I hope we can find a way to continue the discussion. Um, uh, thank you very much to all of you. Bye bye.